Let us turn to Lord's Day 33 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 33. Of how many parts doth the true conversion of man consist? Of two parts, of the mortification of the old and the quickening of the new man. What is the mortification of the old man? It is a sincere sorrow of heart that we have provoked God by our sins and more and more to hate and flee from them. What is the quickening of the new man? It is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ and with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. But what are good works? Only those which proceed from a true faith are performed according to the law of God and to his glory, and not such as are founded on our imaginations or the institutions of men. Are you converted? Perhaps someone has asked that question of you before, or perhaps you have asked that question of someone else. And usually, when someone asks such a question, it is to ask them, have you had a conversion experience? Was there a time in the past when you were turned about from sin to God? Perhaps as some kind of dramatic event in your life. The most common scenario is of an evangelistic crusade, where someone is brought under conviction of sin, they say, they go up to the front of the meeting and they give their life to Jesus Christ. This person, they say, has been completely transformed from, say, a drunkard or some other gross form of sin and is now sober and in his right mind. And many of these converts are sincere. Something emotional may well have happened to them. But is that what the Bible means? and our Heidelberg Catechism means by conversion. It is true, of course, some Christians have had a dramatic type of conversion. The most obvious examples you can think of in the Bible are Paul on Damascus Road, the jailer at Philippi, and Zacchaeus the publican at Jericho. But there are others whose experience has not been as dramatic as this. For example, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, is said that of a child, he has known the Holy Scriptures. He had no sudden dramatic conversion. He was a believer from his childhood. And that is common among those brought up in the church, those born to godly parents, catechized by the minister, who then make confession of faith at some point in their life, they have, as it were, always been Christians. They can't remember a time when they weren't Christians. And sometimes we are tempted to doubt our own conversion or the conversion of other people because we cannot and they cannot, to our satisfaction, pinpoint a time in the past where they were radically changed. But the question we asked at the beginning is wrong. You don't ask the question, are you converted? You ask the question, are you being converted? Are you daily being converted? Are you daily turning by the power of God's grace from sin, unrighteousness, the devil, and the world, and are you turning, by the power of God's grace, to God, to righteousness? Is that your life? Because conversion is not something that happens only once to a person. Maybe 10 years ago at a meeting, and that's the last you ever see of them in the Christian church. Nor is conversion something that man does. God is the one who converts a sinner. God is the one who turns a sinner about. He's going in one direction, away from God, towards sin, walking in the ways of sin. And then God turns him about toward himself. 
A conversion is one of the steps in salvation, and all of the steps in salvation are performed by God Himself. Regeneration, calling, conversion, faith, justification, sanctification, glorification, all those steps are performed by God Himself. So the question is, are you this morning, are you day by day being converted? And that's the subject of Lord's Day 33, of how many parts doth the true conversion of man consist? And we have there two parts. It's a lifelong turning from sin to God by the power of Jesus Christ. And if you can say, 10 years ago I was converted, but today I live like the devil, and I have no interest in living as a Christian, you cannot claim to be converted. Most likely, if that was your experience, you were deceived. At the very best, you are badly backslidden and must repent and turn from your sin and you unto God. So the Christian life then is one long experience of conversion, turning. It has two parts. True conversion, first the mortification of the old man, and second the quickening of the new man. The Heidelberg Catechism, following Ephesians 4, which we read together, speaks of the old man and the new man. And a Christian, one who is being converted, has those two parts within him. The old man must be mortified and the new man must be quickened. The old man is the flesh, the sinful nature of man. Our sinful nature. That nature with which we were born. That nature which we received from our parents and ultimately which we received from our first parent, Adam. And that old man, that old nature, is wicked and corrupt. Verse 22 of Ephesians 4 says, Put off concerning the former conversation or conduct the old man, which is corrupt. He's corrupt. The old man is totally depraved. He is evil. He is only evil. He is desperately wicked. And he is in us the source of all evil. But do not imagine for a moment that the old man is someone you can blame for all of your sins. Because the old man is our sinful nature. He's our flesh. He doesn't belong to someone else. He belongs to us. He's part of us. And so when the old man within us sins, we sin. We are responsible for our old man. He's corrupt. He's always corrupt. He never improves this old man. He never learns to become better. He cannot be reformed. He will not be eradicated in this life. He will remain with us until our dying day, until we are gasping our last breath. The old man will be there. And even if you are an elderly Christian who's been a Christian for many 50 years, your old man is just as corrupt and wicked and deceitful as, a Christ, as an old man within a child or a Christian who hasn't been a Christian for very long at all because the old man never gets any better. He's also, verse 22 tells us, deceitful. Put him off, the old man who is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And that means, beloved, that you may not and you cannot trust the old man within. Because the old man within your sinful flesh is always seeking some way in which he can indulge his lust to sin. He will try every trick in the book. He will ally himself with the devil and the world to bring you into sin. Because that's what the old man loves. 
sin. He is attracted to sin and therefore he attracts you to sin. He desires to sin and therefore wants you to sin and me to sin. And we all have this flesh within us in different forms. One man's flesh or old man might be attracted to a certain kind of sin which another Christian might not have difficulty with. But all of us have an old man of sin, and he wants to sin. He can't be trusted, you can't rely on him to do the right thing. It's very foolish, therefore, for any Christian to trust his own sinful flesh. And our calling, with respect to this old man, this flesh within us, is to mortify him. And that word means to kill to put to death. In scripture we have the idea of crucifying the flesh. Galatians 5.24 says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And this calling to mortify the flesh, or crucify the flesh, is described in various passages of scripture under various figures, but always with the same idea. Turn away from sin. Ephesians 4.22 that he put off concerning the former conversation or conduct the old man. The idea is to take it off and throw it away from yourself. To cast it away from yourself. Think of an old, dirty, smelly coat. You don't want to wear it? Get rid of it. That's the idea. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify, kill. Find your dearest sin and stab it through the heart. Slaughter it. Destroy it. Show it no mercy. That's the idea there. Matthew 5, Jesus speaks about cutting out your eye and cutting off your hand when those parts of your body offend you or tempt you to sin. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul says this, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. The idea is, I beat my body into subjection. I beat it with many punches until it's black and blue and submissive to me. That's the idea of mortifying the old man. Of course, all of these are spiritual expressions which tell us we must deal ruthlessly with our sin and any tendency we have to sin. We must oppose the old man with all of our strength. We must never compromise with him. We must always say no to him. Now you can't beat the old man with physical punches or stab him with a knife or cut off his hand or his eye. And if you could, it would do you no good. Because sin is not to be found in your body. Sin is to be found in your spirit. And the idea that you can beat yourself physically into submission is the error of asceticism. That was the idea that the monks had in the Middle Ages. You beat yourself, you whip yourself, you lie on a bed of nails to try and stop yourself from sinning and all the rest. Wear a hair shirt to make yourself itch to death. Put grass down your shirt. Whatever it was, asceticism, it doesn't help. Rather, we do these things spiritually. We don't indulge him, the old man. We say no to him, always and consistently. And the old man will try to stop you from saying no to him. He is like a spoiled child in many ways. He will whine. He will plead. He will throw a tantrum. He will promise to be nice if you only give him what he wants this one time. Say no. Always say no. I am personifying, in a way, the old man. But this is the way the old man works. Let's say it's time for church on Sunday morning. The old man of sin does not want to go. He doesn't want to hear the word of God. He doesn't want to hear about righteousness and truth. He doesn't like to hear about those things. 
He wants to indulge his own pleasures and sins. So he'll say, it's raining outside. Do you really want to go because it's raining outside? And you'll be tempted to stay at home because it's raining outside. Or he'll distract you with something on television perhaps. Oh, just turn it on for five minutes. And before you know it, you've watched it for an hour. And guess what? Now it's too late to go to this church. We might as well stay at home. And after all, will it matter if you miss just once? Let's just miss it once. And these people go, I promise. Next week comes along and it's inconvenient to go again. And your resolve becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and the old man gets his way. You must say no, decisively, no. We will go to church. We will hear the word of God. That's how we worship our God who has done so many wonderful things for us as we have learned in the second section of the Heidelberg Catechism on Deliverance. I remind you, we're now in the section called Gratitude. Our Catechism explains this mortifying of the old man with a spiritual attitude and a spiritual activity. The attitude is a sincere sorrow of heart that we have provoked God by our sins. That is the essence and the heart of biblical repentance. If a person is not sorry for his sin, he or she is not going to turn away from his sin. If a person delights in his sin and loves his sin, he is not going to turn away from that sin. And by nature, According to the old man, we delight in sin. So we must kill the old man who delights in sin. Notice that in Ephesians 4, speaking of the Gentiles by nature, verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all on cleanness with greediness. That's us by nature. We work on cleanness with greenness. We can't get enough of it, in other words. When God turns us about from our natural propensity to evil, he causes us to see sin as we never saw it before. It's something abhorrent and wicked and vile and terrible. We want to flee from it Therefore, and we see God's holiness in a way we never saw it before. We see God as the righteous and the holy and the true God and the God that we love because he has given unto us salvation. And we are sorry because we provoked him to anger by our sin. Not simply a change of mind abstractly about sin, but a change of mind about our own particular sin. We're sorry for our sin, not just sin in society, but our own sin. Because we have offended God by that sin. And this sorrow of heart, beloved, is necessary for us if we are to withstand the lures of the old man. The old man will try and convince us again that sin is not that bad. And maybe a little bit of sin is actually beneficial to us. Perhaps we've overreacted to this idea of sin. And after all, there's lots of pleasure to be had in sin. And the old man will never agree with the regenerated man, with the new man given to us in salvation, that sin is evil, abhorrent, and to be avoided at all costs. We must have, therefore, a genuine sorrow over our sin. Well, that's more than simply worldly sorrow or regret or remorse. Worldly regret has sorrow over the consequences of sin. Let's say a young man gets drunk, he drives a car, he has a terrible accident, he kills someone, he shows remorse because of the consequences of his sin. 
Let's say a man is a thief, he's caught red-handed, verbally in someone's house, he's arrested. He feels remorse because of the consequences of sin. But ask that person, would you do it again if you thought you could get away with it? Do you love the sin of drunkenness? Do you love the sin of stealing? And he would say, oh yes. If I get out of this prison cell, I will go back to what I was doing before. That's not sorrow over sin. Worldly regret leads a man to self-pity, to bitterness against God because of the consequences he must now face in his life, to despair or even to suicide, but that is not godly sorrow. Because godly sorrow leads a man to see sin as something against God and leads a man to seek forgiveness with God because he has a hope that God is a merciful God. Judas Iscariot felt remorse. He came to the priest and said, I have betrayed innocent blood, take back the money that I have for betraying Jesus Christ. Then he went out and hanged himself led to despair it was not a true sorrow over his sin david as we have seen in psalm 32 we will see again but willing this evening david had true sorrow for sin and he sought the forgiveness of his god and received that forgiveness and any sorrow that does not lead you beloved to the cross of jesus christ to find forgiveness is not true sorrow for sin is worldly sorrow which leads to despair. The reason we are sorry for our sin then is because we have provoked God to anger against us because of our sin. And therefore our sorrow is not rooted in self-love. Sin makes me feel bad. Sin is evil consequences for me in my life. But a love of God. We hope in the mercy of God and therefore we come to God sorry for our sin, pleading the merits of Jesus Christ. If we did not have that confidence, we would not come. We would be afraid to come. We would be bitter against God's justice and we would despair as do the wicked. But because we know God loves us in Jesus Christ, we are confident that in the way of our confessing our sin and turning from our sin, that God will certainly forgive us and wash us clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we desire, therefore, to be thankful. And we are sorry, very sorry, when instead of being thankful, we sin against God who has done so much for us in Jesus Christ. That's the spiritual attitude, sorrow for sin, but that must lead to a spiritual activity, and we have that in the Catechism as well. Hitting sin and fleeing from sin. Hitting of sin is painful. That's why it's called mortification of the old man, or even a crucifying of the flesh. Because we are called to hate something that is deeply ingrained within our own nature and something that by nature that we actually love. And that old man has been crucified, but only in principle. He's still there. He's still very much alive and kicking. He still has much influence in our life. And therefore we must pray to God to strengthen us in the battle against that old man. The old man is doomed to die one day when we are finally glorified in heaven. And as the devil, the old man knows that his time is short and so he rages furiously against us. It's painful. Very painful to mortify your own flesh. 
That explains Jesus' very strong language in Matthew 5 about plucking out your right eye and cutting off your right hand. Let's read that in Matthew chapter 5 for a moment. Verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell into hell. What is more precious to a person than his right eye and his right hand? And Jesus says, the old man of sin, your flesh, uses the members of your body. Yes, sin starts within the heart, but the heart becomes inflamed with lust by receiving things through the body members. For example, a person has lost in his heart, looking at something, say pornography, looking at something will inflame his lust as the eye provides more fuel for the fire, as it were. And so Jesus says, rather than allow your bodily members to give fuel to the fire of your old man and inflame your lust, Cut them off, pluck them out, throw them away from you. And the principle is this, do not allow any of the members of your body to lead you into sin. Do not use any of your bodily members to indulge your desires or your sinful passions. You can apply that to all kinds of things. Television the internet. Do not allow your eye to see things on television or on the internet that will inflame your passions and feed the old man and give him strength to sin. Rather than allow that, says Christ, pluck your eye out. Books, magazines, the same idea. Rather than allow your tongue to lie, cut your tongue out. Rather than use your hand to steal, cut your hand off. Rather than go to an ungodly venue, say a party or somewhat, cut your feet off. If you're tempted to listen to something wicked, cut your ears off. And that might mean that you have to throw away things in your life. It's painful, remember, that's the idea of illustration. It's painful. Throw away books, games, videos, whatever it is that's tempting you to sin, whatever your body is using to bring you into subjection to any sin, Jesus says, get rid of it. Now, without delay. And as I said before, he's not talking about literal mutilation of the body. If you cut your hand off, it will not make you less of a sinner. If you pluck your eyes out, your, your flesh will find some other way to indulge its passions. But the idea is, it's difficult. It's urgent. That's the point that Jesus is making. And so you can see that conversion, this first part especially, conversion cannot possibly be the work of man. Because it's impossible for us, by nature, to do these things. It's as difficult as to ask someone to cut off his right hand, or to pluck out his right eye. Sin is too attractive, sin is too deceitful, too alluring for us to resist it without the grace of God. That's why the Bible consistently says that God turns us to himself. Here's Jeremiah 31, 18. 
Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Lamentations 5.21, very similar. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. Lamentations 5, 21. When God then turns us to him, he makes us active in the Christian life as we turn daily from sin and daily to him. But conversion ultimately is a work of God. So mortification is the negative aspect of conversion. We're turning away from sin. But there's also a positive aspect of conversion, which is to turn toward God. And that is called, in the Heidelberg Catechism and in Ephesians 4, the quickening of the new man, or the putting on of the new man. Those kind of ideas. We've seen the old man, he is the old flesh, the sinful nature which we have within us even after we are converted, remaining in us from our parents, ultimately from Adam. The new man is the exact opposite of the old man. He is the life of Jesus Christ implanted into us as a seed in regeneration. So a Christian has two aspects within him. He's the old man, but also in the same Christian is the new man who is the life of Jesus Christ. And only believers have a new man. Unbelievers don't have a new man. They only have the old man. And the new man is the new, the real you. The old man is part of you. You're responsible for what he does because he's part of you. But he is passing away. His time, as it were, is numbered. His days are numbered. The new man, the new you, is the real you who will live forever in heaven. The old man will be destroyed at death. But the new man will be with us by the grace of God forever. That explains some of the puzzling language in Romans chapter 7 where Paul says, But not I, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's not there saying, I'm not to blame for the old man, that's not me. What he's saying is, the real me is the new man. The old man's still there. I'm responsible for him. He makes me miserable, but I'm opposed to him because of the new man. The new man is the real me. I, Paul, no longer live. As he says in Galatians 2.20, Christ lives within me. And this new man is the opposite of the old man. The old man loves sin. The new man loves righteousness. The new man hates sin and loves holiness. The old man is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, totally depraved. The new man is holy. And notice, the new man cannot sin. That's 1 John 3 verse 19. First John 3, sorry, verse 9. First John 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God, that's the new man of Jesus Christ in regeneration, doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And that does not mean that the Christian does not sin. 
But what it means is this, according to the new man of Jesus Christ within the Christian, the real man, he cannot sin. He sins according to the old man yet, of course. 1 John 1 tells us that. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is in us. But the new man cannot sin. He cannot sin because the new man is the image of Jesus Christ restored to us in regeneration. We see that in Ephesians 4 again. Ephesians 4 verse 24, speaking of the new man, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And Colossians also speaks of this new man. Colossians 3 verse 10, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the new man is the image of Jesus Christ, who himself is the image of God, implanted as a seed into the heart of the Christian, and out of which seed then the new man and the new life of Christ sprouts forth in a life of conversion and good works. And so this new man must and is utterly opposed to the old man. We have no life by nature. We are spiritually dead and corrupt. The old man is there and then God comes along by sovereign grace and plants into the heart a new principle of life and immediately there's a battle between these two men. Romans 7 talks about that battle at great length. Galatians 5 verse 17 speaks of it as well. Galatians 5 verse 17. For the flesh, that the old man, lusteth against the spirit, that's the new man, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That explains the struggle within the Christian. You can think of it this way. You've got a one-room apartment. Two men, your mortal enemies, are living in that one-room apartment. One of them wants to devote the entire apartment to, the, to, the, to sin. The other one wants to devote the entire apartment to God's glory and holiness. There's a constant struggle for supremacy between these two men. That explains much about the Christian life. That explains our struggle. Do you find it difficult to say no to sin? Do you find sin attractive and alluring? Are you strangely attracted to things you know that they're wrong, but you still want them? Even though part of you does not want them. And you feel sometimes that there's two people living within you. Do you find it easier to spend hours watching television and other frivolous entertainment and very, very difficult to read the Bible for even a few minutes? Do you think you're abnormal in this? Do you find it easy to be proud and envious and selfish, but difficult to be loving and kind and considerate and humble? Do you find it difficult to pray, to concentrate on the preaching of the gospel, sometimes difficult to stir yourself up even to believe? And do you find that discouraging at times and think, am I really a Christian? Could I be a Christian with all of these evil thoughts, all of these struggles and difficulties? Shouldn't I be on a higher plane of spirituality by now? That's the normal Christian life. Romans 7 tells us that. Galatians 5.17 tells us that. Ye cannot do the things that ye would. Ye cannot do 
the things that you would. All the Galatian Christians wanted to do good works and they wanted to do things which please God and they wanted to avoid sin. But there's a struggle going on within them and Paul explains it this way. The flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other. And the solution, verse 16 says, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's another idea, or another way of saying, quicken the new man and mortify the old. And this struggle will last our entire life. Do not expect that when you are 85 or 95 and fought sin for all of those years, it will now become easy to fight against sin. I have talked to elderly saints, and they say it's still as difficult as ever it was. And is that discouraging to you? It should not be, because God has promised that one day he will destroy the old man entirely. And one day the new man will be the only one left. We will live a perfect life in glory. And so our, our calling with respect to this new man is the opposite of our calling with respect to the old man. Old man, kill him, destroy him, say no to him, deny him at every point. The new man, quicken him, or make him alive, or bring him to life. And how do we do that? And what exactly is that? Our Heidelberg Catechism says, it is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ, and with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. Conversion is a matter of the heart. We mortify by hating sin, by having a sincere sorrow of heart over our sin. We quicken the new man with sincere joy of heart in God, by living in gratitude to God for what he has done for us. And that, of course, is only possible through Jesus Christ. We only have a new man because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, earning for us that seed of new life be within us. And we have the Spirit who strengthens us and gives us the ability to walk according to this man, this new man. And this conversion, therefore, is rooted in our love for God. We desire to show that love by walking in the Spirit by rejoicing in God and by walking in all good works. And how do we do that practically? Well, let me give you an illustration. Think of a man who has two dogs. One is a cute, gentle, fluffy little dog who is so nice always obedient, will lick your hand and come near him. The other is a vicious, mad dog with rabies who snarls and attacks anyone who comes near him. Now my question is this, which of those dogs will be the stronger one? The nice, obedient dog or the big, snarling brute? of a dog? And the answer is, whichever one you feed the most will be the stronger one. And our calling, therefore, is to feed the new man and to starve the old man. To feed the nice dog and to deprive the big scary dog of its food. To beat the scary dog with a big stick. So he is beaten, as it were, into submission. And to give the good dog everything he needs to grow and to thrive. Then, by God's grace, the bad dog will have less influence in our lives. He will be under, somewhat under control. And the good dog will be strengthened 
And we will have the ability to do good works and to glorify God and to live in thanksgiving to God. How do we do that practically? What do we feed the new man with? Spiritual food. Prayer. We pray. Lord, strengthen the new man within me. Lord, give me the strength to crucify the old man and all of his lusts. Through reading of the scriptures. The old man hits the scriptures. The new man feeds off the scriptures and is strengthened by the scriptures. Through fellowship with other believers and especially through the preaching of the gospel which is the chief means of grace whereby the new man is strengthened and quickened and the old man is crucified and starved. Because if you stay at home and watch some movie, you're feeding the old man. Especially if it's a movie with disgusting images in it. But if you come to church and hear the preaching of the gospel, you're feeding the new man. Ungodly friendships, whether in real life or in cyberspace on Facebook, they feed the old man. Good, wholesome Christian friendship and fellowship that will feed the new man. And from the strength you receive from the means of grace, preaching especially, reading the Bible, prayer, fellowship with other Christians, you will have the strength more and more to mortify the old man and to quicken the new man. And more and more you will be able, by God's grace, to live to the will of God in all good works. The good works described in answer 91. Those that come from true faith. Unbelievers, by definition, cannot perform good works, but Christians can do and must. Those performed according to the law of God, and those performed the glory of God. That, beloved, is the Christian life. A constant turning away from sin and a turning unto God. A mortifying of the old man and a quickening of the new man. It's difficult. It's grueling, but it's rewarding, and it's blessed. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that thou wouldst quicken in us the new man, and give unto us the strength we require from thy word, in the preaching of the gospel, and also in our own reading of thy word throughout the week. Give unto us the strength to mortify our flesh, which is so powerful within us, and we find sin to be so alluring. Forgive us, Father, and give us strength, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.